Yeah.
We sing this morning, we sing that we want to be taken into your presence. Lord, we know that you're everywhere. We know that your spirit is within us. We know that we also sometimes look to ourselves too much. We look to things other than you. And this morning, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that we be taken into your presence, that we already, we already there, but that our hearts would, would see that. We ask that you would light the fire within us. Help us to strive after you. Help us desire to build your kingdom here, Lord. Lord, we desire for more love, more power. Not for our sake, Lord, but to build that kingdom that we want to be used by you for your plan, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, worship team. Forgot to mention earlier that the uh, annual meeting will be here in this room. It will not be on video, so it won't be in the gym, it won't be online. So I encourage you to be present here in the uh, sanctuary for the meeting next week. Let's pray together as we come to God's word this morning. Father, it is certainly our uh, heart's desire as uh, we've been singing as uh, Wayne Eric prayed, uh, Father, we want to be drawn into your presence. Father, we want more of you. We don't want to be satisfied with just a small portion of you. But, Father, we want a deep, abiding relationship with you. And, Father, I pray that you would cause us to hunger and to thirst for you, that you would cause us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Father, that we would not settle for second best, that we wouldn't settle for other substitutes, but that we would be passionately devoted to you. And Father, we thank you for who you are, for how you have demonstrated your power in our lives, how you demonstrate your grace, how you pour that out to us abundantly, how you meet us right where we are and how you provide the encouragement and the strength and the hope and the healing and whatever it is that we lack, how you, you provide that abundantly. And Father, we pray that you would continue to do that. that. Father, just as you have done, that you would continue to do that, that we would not lack any good thing, but that we would see that all good gifts come from you. And Father, we thank you uh, for that. Uh, Father, we pray that you would continue to guide and direct in the life of our church as we uh, come to another annual meeting next week, that you would guide in the decisions that are made, uh, the plans that are made, uh, that they would honor you. Father, we continue to pray that you would reopen our church, that you would reopen our city, that you'd reopen our state, that you'd reopen our nation, that you would gain victory over this virus, and that you would even now be using it to get people's attention, to cause them to look to you for answers. Father, we pray for those in leadership in our city, in our state, in our nation, that you would guide them and give them wisdom and direct them to plans and purposes and programs that will bring about justice, and honor and glory to you. We pray that you would be honored in all that takes place. Father, we pray that you'd guide us as we uh, look to your word this morning to continue to shape us into the kind of a church, the kind of a community that you desire us to be. And so we commit all of this to you in the name of your Son and our Savior Jesus. Amen. The story is told of a young monk who was assigned to give his first sermon in the monastery. And he was 
pretty frightened. He was a little bit intimidated. And so as he climbed into the pulpit for his very first sermon, he said with a certain amount of trepidation, do any of you know what I am going to say? And none of the brothers raised their hands. And so he responded with a little bit of fear and trepidation and said, well, neither do I. Dominus Vobiscum, which is the traditional greeting of the Lord be with you. And he left. And needless to say, his superiors severely chastised him for taking the easy way out. And so they assigned him to preach again the next week. So the next uh, Sunday, he got up in front of the, uh, the pulpit and he started with the same question. Do any of you know what I'm going to say? Well, this time the uh, brothers decided they were going to teach him a lesson, so every hand went up. And so he responded and said, well, since you all know, you don't need the sermon. Dominus vobiscum. And he left. Well, needless to say, his superiors were not uh, impressed with that, and they chastised him again and assigned him the next week to preach. And so the third Sunday, he got up and started with the same question. Do any of you know what I'm going to say? And this time, you know, the brothers decided they're really going to teach him a lesson, so half the hands went up, and the other half did not. So he looked at them and said, well, those of you who know, tell those who don't. (laughs) Dominus vobiscum. And he left again. I think there's times where we're like that as well, when people ask us the question, what's the purpose of the church? Why does the church exist? And we wrestle with the question of what is the church to be and to do? And generally, when we answer that question, when we think about it, we jump to the latter part, the do part. And we talk about, well, you know, a church needs to have certain programs. You know, you've got to have a Sunday school program. You have to have a you know, something for children, you need a choir, you need, uh, you know, this program, and maybe a, a sports program, and, and we jump into the, the doing part, and all the programs that we think a church needs to have. But we wrestle with, what's the church to be? What kind of a church should we be? What's the purpose of the church? What is it that should characterize our ministry as a church. Well, what we're going to see this morning and the passage we're going to look at is that the church is to be a caring community. It's to be a community that's made up of a family of families. Some families are single, some are couples, some have kids, some don't have kids. But it's a family of families that has certain core values. They're passionate about the scriptures, about God's word. They're passionate about fellowship, about worship, about prayer. And they make an impact in the community because outreach is just a natural byproduct of what they do. It's not a program that they do, but it's a natural byproduct because as they make an impact, the surrounding community is curious about what makes you different. What we're going to see is that the church is to be a caring community, passionate about God's word, about fellowship, about worship, about prayer, and where outreach is just a natural byproduct of what takes place because we share life together. Well, we're in the midst of a series talking about the nature of our church, the purpose of our church. We have a purpose statement that says we're building a community to change the world. And as I've explained the last few weeks, the elders spent several months wrestling with the questions of what should that community look like? How can we have an impact? How can we bring about change in our world, in our community? And to help define that, we came up with eight words, four or four two-word pairs to further define the kind of community, the kind of impact. That we want to be a faithfully following, Christ-centered, Bible-believing, caring community. And so each Sunday during January, we're looking at one of those elements, 
And then next Sunday, we'll wrap up the series talking about the vision and values that we want to see as we move forward into the future. And so we started the first Sunday of January asking the question, what's it mean to be a faithful follower? If we want to be faithfully following, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And so we looked at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28, where Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to truly follow me, here's what you need to do. You need to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And so we saw that a faithful follower needs to basically get themselves out of the way. They need to die to self and give their life away if they really want to receive God's approval. They want to receive the rewards that God promises. Then we asked the second question, what's it mean to be Christ-centered? And we looked at Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul describes a Christ-centered life and a Christ-centered ministry. And where Paul presents the idea that a Christ-centered life is centered on salvation, Christ died for us, but not only is that a statement of what he did for us, but it's the motivating factor of why we should move forward. That because he died for us, we want to live for him. And one of the ways we live for him is by sharing the gospel. Because he has appointed us as his ambassadors here on the planet. And the way that we bring about change in our world is one heart at a time. It's not through programs. It's not through social endeavors, but it's through sharing the good news of the gospel and allowing God to transform people. Well, last week we asked the question, what's it mean to be Bible-believing? We have Bible in our name as a church, but what does it mean to truly believe the Bible? And so we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, probably the key passage in Scripture about Scripture. And what we discovered is that the Bible is given by God, it's inspired by God, and it's given for the purpose of transformation. It's not given to make us smarter sinners, but it's to change our lives. And Scripture is given to change us, to transform us. So today we're asking the question about that fourth element, the what's it mean to be a caring community? And as I said, what we're going to discover in the passage we're going to look at this morning is that a caring community is a family of families that's passionate about God's word, about fellowship, about worship, about prayer, and where outreach is a natural byproduct of sharing life together. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2, the uh, last paragraph in that chapter, verses 42 to 47, that describes the early church in Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost, after the Spirit comes and what takes place and how this community of faith begins to come together and what they are like. Because it provides a model for what a caring community looks like. So Acts chapter 2, beginning in uh, verse 42. And they, the early church, the early believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What we're going to see in this passage is that a caring community has four commitments and they have four practices, four core values, if you will, and four things that they do. 
the four commitments, the four core values, is that they are committed to the scriptures. They're committed to fellowship, to the Lord's table, and to prayer. Those are the things that characterize everything they do. They're not programs, but they're commitments. They're, they're core values. And then there's four practices. They practice inspiring worship, sensitive generosity, mutual ministry, and outreach. Four things that characterize everything they do, and then four things that they practice, four things that they do. And we're going to see that these are the, the characteristics of a caring community. If we want to be a caring community, these are things that we need to be committed to. These are things that we need to do, that we need to practice. The first thing you see is it says that they were devoted. They were passionately devoted. When you think about passionate devotion, you think of sports. Someone who is willing to put on the jersey, the uniform, the sweatshirt, the t-shirt of their favorite team. They put on the face paint, the headgear, and they cheer their lungs out for their team. That is passionate devotion. However, many of us, our devotion is a little bit like the dog Doug in the movie Up. That Doug was passionately committed, and then squirrel, and he chases after that. And that's the reality. Many of us, that's our devotion. We're devoted to Jesus, and then we chase after work, or we chase after leisure activities. We chase after this problem or that problem. And we need to get back to the idea of truly being focused on what is most important. It's very easy for us as individuals, it's very easy for us as a church to get busy doing good things, but not focus on what's most important. And a caring community is passionately devoted to four key things. The first is they're passionately devoted to the scriptures. They're passionately devoted to God's word. These new believers, they were passionately devoted to the apostles' teaching. They could not get enough of what the scripture said. And it talks about that they met in the in the uh, temple. They met house to house. They spent time together studying. What does God's, what is God saying to us? If I followed you for a week, could I find what you are passionately devoted to? See, the reality is some people are, they're passionately devoted to video games because that's where they spend the bulk of their time. Some people are passionately devoted to sports and they can quote the uh, batting average of the third baseman for the 69 Mets and what took place on this day in sports history. Some people are passionately devoted to keeping up with the latest gossip and what's going on and, and who's doing what. Some are passionately devoted to movies and they know movie dialogue better than they perhaps know the scriptures. Some people are passionately devoted to music, and they know every lyric of every song in the top 40. But to be a caring community, we need to be passionately devoted to God's word. And again, this is not a program. This is not saying that we have to have Sunday school, that we have to have Bible studies. Those are tools, they're means to an end. But it's the idea that we need to be passionately committed to studying, to reading, to really, truly knowing God's word. And that is where you need to make time for that. You need to make time for personal reading and study. Maybe you get uh, you know, a series of the scriptures on CD and you plug it into your car while you're driving or while you're walking. You, you listen to it. You get into a Sunday school class or a small group Bible study or you listen to sermons or podcasts 
to know what does Scripture say. And so, again, it's the idea of it's a commitment, and there are tools like Sunday school and other things that help you to do that. But it's a passionate devotion to truly understanding what Scripture says to center your life on that. In addition to passionately devoted to God's word, they're passionately devoted to fellowship. And what's interesting here is, depending on your translation, it doesn't say they were devoted to fellowship. They're devoted to the fellowship. There's a very specific, distinctive element to it. See, we have the idea that fellowship is coffee and donuts in the church basement. That, yeah, food plays a a role in fellowship, certainly. But fellowship is not the fellowship hour between Sunday school and church. Fellowship is not a potluck dinner. See, fellowship is not a program. Fellowship is the idea of sharing life together. And you see that word repeated through this section, together, together, together. They had things in common. They shared. One of the things that hinders fellowship is individuality, especially here in the West, because we have the idea that I have a personal relationship with God, and I don't need you. I just need my Bible and time with God. I don't need a church, I don't need a small group, I don't need people. And as a result, people float in and out of churches and never connect because they're not truly committed to the fellowship. What we have to understand is that fellowship is not an activity. It is not a program. It is not a potluck dinner. Those things help, yes. But that is not fellowship. See, the best fellowship is a byproduct that comes from studying together, praying together, serving together, sharing life together. The best fellowship comes from a commitment to be together, especially in serving and praying and studying, not just in kibitzing, not just in talking. The best fellowship is a byproduct. Probably some of my best friends are those that I have traveled with, those I've served with, those that I've been in ministry with, because we've been able to go deep over time serving Christ. So the caring community is committed to the scriptures. They're committed to the fellowship. They're also committed to the Lord's table, to the breaking of bread, which I think refers to this element of communion, the Lord's table. But it's much more than just saying, okay, if we're going to be committed to the Lord, to the breaking of bread, we have to have communion once a month or once a week, depending on your tradition and your church you're in. I think it's much more than that, because what it is when you really study what communion is all about, it's about sharing the message of the gospel. As Jesus said, every time you break bread, you tell the message until I come. And so being committed to the breaking of bread is really being committed to once again telling the message that Jesus Christ died for our sins and we can be forgiven. Penalty is paid in full and that we're forgiven. A commitment to the breaking of bread means that we become a fellowship characterized by grace, by sharing the message of grace, but also by showing grace, forgiving others in the same way that we've been forgiven. So it's much more than just having, you know, crackers and grape juice once a month. It's an attitude of forgiveness and grace that we share that message with other people. 
caring community is passionately devoted to the scriptures, to fellowship, to the Lord's table, and to prayer. And again, it doesn't mean that it's a program. It doesn't mean you have to have a Wednesday night prayer meeting to be committed to prayer. What it means is that you start, you end, you bathe everything in prayer. Not just meet once a week for it. And again, what gets in the way of this is individuality. Saying that I'm not going to tell you what my prayer requests are. I've just has an, an unspoken request. Which being translated means I'm going to carry my burdens myself. Thank you very much. Because I am independent and I am strong and I'm not going to tell you. To be committed to prayer, we need times of both personal prayer and corporate prayer. Personal prayer where we share our needs with other people and ask them to pray for us. But also times where we ask others, how can I pray for you? And then truly pray rather than say, hey, I'll pray for you. And then you forget about it until the next time you see the person and then you offer up a quick prayer so you can say, hey, I prayed for you this week. We also need times of corporate prayer. We have a, a prayer sheet that uh, Gail writes and, and uh, publishes on Wednesdays about needs within our body that we can pray for. Over the last uh, year, we've had, uh, you know, every two, three months, we've had a prayer gathering where we've opened up the church. We've provided a, a prayer guide for people to be able to pray for those things. Someday, when uh, COVID is lifted, we'll probably have prayer meeting again. We can still pray, and we can still have prayer gatherings, even though it's not as formal as it used to be. But it's the idea that we're committed to prayer. We start, we end, we bathe everything we do in prayer. I think I mentioned this in passing last week, but one of the things I do that became a habit for me during the summer, uh, I think probably prompted by COVID, was on Friday mornings, I pace through the building and I pray. I pray for each one of you that are going to be seated in these chairs. I, I pray for the sound system and the technology. I pray that the church and the hallways and the classrooms will once again be filled with people. That we will be a lighthouse in this community. And that, like I say, that's the one of the things that, uh, that I started doing on Friday morning. Nobody's here except me. I've got my parka and my hat on as I'm walking through the sanctuary because it's freezing in here on Fridays, believe me. But it's one of the things that, that I do, and I've, it's become a practice because it's become a conviction. I realize how much we need God to work. And that's how I demonstrate my, my uh, commitment to prayer. See, a caring community has four core values, four key commitments. Not programs, but commitments, values. They're committed to the scriptures. They're committed to the fellowship, being together. They're committed to grace in the Lord's table. And they're committed to prayer. They also have four practices. And again, not so much programs, but things they, they do. They're expressed in programs, yes. But four practices. They practice inspiring worship. Sensitive generosity. Mutual ministry. and church. You see that Church was never intended to be boring. And I think there, there's times where, because of past experiences, there's times where we come to church expecting to be bored. And we allow ourselves to be distracted by our phones, by other things, by staying up too late on Saturday night and not coming rested and ready to worship. 
And one of the things we need to do, I think, is to recapture a sense of awe and wonder at what God is doing in our midst. And I think part of the answer to that is we need to take ourselves out of the picture. For far too often, we make worship about me. And I'm convinced, and I've said this before, that we ask the wrong questions about worship. We focus on how many people were present. What was the attendance like? What were the numbers? Who was there? You know what the real question is? The real question is, was God here? Was God present? See, far too often we ask the question, did I like the music? Did they sing my favorite song? Did I like the sermon? Did I like the service? See, the real question is, what did God think? Did God like the singing? Did God like the the message? What did God think about the service? Was God pleased with the worship? See, the real question we need to be asking is, who was worshiped? Because when I make worship all about me, my preference, my favorites, ultimately I'm worshiping me because I'm putting me in charge. But when I'm focusing on what God thinks and bringing praise and glory to him, then I'm worshiping him. And we need to change our whole mindset of how we approach worship to practice truly inspiring worship. Because then we're looking for what God's doing, and we're saying, wow, look what God did there. And we're praising him. We need times of personal worship. We need times of corporate worship. We need times of personal worship where we make time daily to worship God through reading the scriptures and saying, wow, look what God did here in this passage. What might he do in my life today? Use music, use praise, use prayer. Keep a journal where you record, what's God teaching me? Where do I see God at work? And then give thanks daily for who God is and for what he's doing. Make time for corporate worship. And this is where I would say is commit yourself to a local church. Because the reality is there are many people who attend church, but they're not truly committed to a local church. They come late, they leave early, they don't connect. Come early, not to talk to friends, but come early to prepare your heart, to pray, to say, what do you want me to learn today? God, how do you want to change me today? What do you want to tra- how do you want to transform me today? How can I worship you better today? Be present and be fully engaged. Don't be an observer. Be a full participant. Where you come and you focus on God himself, the audience of one, and you pour your heart into worship. Not just come and say, hey, you know, I didn't meet my needs today. I didn't get anything out of it. Well, the reality, it's not for you. It's you worshiping God. So pour your heart into worship. So not only do we need to practice inspiring worship, we need to practice sensitive generosity. We're 44, it says that they were, they all believed they were together, they had all things in common, They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Sensitive generosity starts by asking the question, what's the real need? And how best do we meet that need? See, someone might say, you know what, I need money. I don't have enough money. And and maybe maybe that is the real need. Maybe because of COVID, you know, a person lost their job, they're unemployed, they have a hard time finding a job, and they've run behind and they need some financial help. But maybe the need really isn't financial. Maybe the problem is they become materialistic. 
and they live beyond their means. And their real need is to learn how to budget and to live on a budget. And so you provide some counseling to help meet the real need. Maybe it sounds like somebody's need is they've got a real problem and they need you to step in and fix it. Well, maybe that is the need, maybe, but the, maybe the real need is they just need someone who will listen to them as they talk about the struggle that they're facing. Because maybe they face an issue that can't be fixed. And they just need somebody to empathize with them. So you have to determine what is the real need, and then how do you meet that need? And that may mean that you open up your calendar. You give time. Maybe it is that you need to open your home to demonstrate hospitality. Maybe it means you need to open your wallet and to give. Ultimately, it means you need to open your heart and to let people in. To demonstrate sensitive generosity and to meet what the need is. They also practiced a mutual ministry. And the key to that, as you see, is the word together. Verse 44, all who believed were together, had all things in common. Verse 46, day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And again, what gets in the way of a mutual ministry is independence. I don't need you. I can do this on my own. What also gets in the way of mutual ministry ministry is the idea that ministry is only done by professionals. And a dozen people can encourage and visit and build up. But if the pastor doesn't do it, it doesn't count. Because ministry is only done by professionals. What's interesting is in chapter 2, what you see is that they were together and needs were being met. Some were selling, some were distributing, some were receiving. And what's interesting is there's no program here. There's no leader saying this is how to do it. In fact, the elders and the deacons don't get involved until four chapters later, chapter six. These are the people ministering to each other because they were together. They were listening, they were paying attention, they are meeting needs. Mutual ministry involves a one-another ministry. There are 20-some one-another commands in the New Testament. These are just half of them. Love one another, serve one another, build up one another, and the list goes on. But it's the idea of I minister to you, you minister to me, it's back and forth, it's together, it's mutual. That's what a community of faith looks like. But they also practiced outreach. They shared life together. They worshiped. They prayed. They gave. They encouraged. They built up. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What's interesting is it's not so much a program at this point. It's not that they did evangelism on Wednesday nights and they visited, you know, uh, newcomers and they shared the gospel with them it goes back to what chapter one says where jesus said you will be my witnesses and what's interesting in acts 1 8 is that is not a command it's a statement you will be witnesses the question is are you a good one or a bad one But these folks were witnesses, they were sharing, they were ministering, they were encouraging, and as a result of that, people came to faith. Because what you discover is that a caring community is attractive to a watching world. There's a world outside these four walls that is going to hell without Jesus Christ, that 
desperately needs hope. And when we live as a caring community to teach and encourage and to build up and to share, people get curious about why do you do what you do? Why do you have hope when everybody else is panicking? Why aren't you worried? And people want to know the answers, and we have it. And we can share with them about the hope that we have. We desire to be a caring community. We desire to be a community of people that are passionately devoted to God's word, passionately devoted to the scriptures, passionately devoted to sharing life together, the fellowship, passionately devoted to grace and the message of grace and forgiveness demonstrated by the Lord's table, passionately devoted to prayer, recognizing that we cannot do anything in our own power. We need God to work in and through us. We're passionately devoted to four things and practicing four things. We want to practice worship that inspires. We have a sense of awe and wonder at what God is doing. We want to be sensitively generous in meeting the needs of people but meeting real needs, not just their felt need. We want to be active in ministering to one another, a mutual ministry, not just a one direction. And we want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the example of this church in Acts. And Father, I pray that we would take this passage, that we would take this example to heart, that you would help us to be people who are passionately devoted to you, to your word, to fellowship, to grace, to prayer. Father, we pray that we would have a greater sense of awe and wonder about what you're doing.